Okay, we are back from break and getting started. Okay, so recall we did a git clone and Yes, we did a git clone of all of the fold files that are on the CryoCloud website, which includes the tutorials. So now in our file browser here on the left, um, you can open that up if it's not open and then find your CryoCloud website folder and just click into that. It's a GUI, just like you'd interact in like File Explorer. Um, and then from there, you'll wanna go into the book. So this is what builds the Jupyter book website. And then from there, these are the different folders that hold the contents. We'll go down to tutorials. And then we'll go into this folder that's uh, is2 underscore atl15. And then from there, we'll pull open the one notebook that's in there. And I'll give you all a second to navigate there and a second for it to load. So for this, you're welcome to follow along, or you can just watch as this goes through. Um, it's easy to just press like run for each of these, um, but it's totally fine if you just want to watch to um, to watch and not necessarily run it in your own command or in your own cloud. Yep, all these tutorials will be on the website. You can, like we're doing here, get clone them and then run through them interactively. Um, but there'll also be a rendered version on the website that you can also look at there. And then we're planning to have uh, a recording of this tutorial. Your current stop. Oh, that's not fun. Okay, so sometimes, oh, yes. One one quick addition here. Uh, when you're looking at your uh, at your screen, what you'll notice is a bunch of information down here. So right here, it says main. That's like where we're kind of at in our Git um, repository. It says no kernel. That means we don't have a kernel working and we can't like actually run uh, this in the way that we need to. It says initializing. It's just going to sit there. It's not going to run properly. And then we see our memory down here. So our memory, 186 megabytes. If you watch that and then your 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 computer crashes when it gets to like the max amount that's allowed for a server, you can tell that by here because it'll get up to that that limit and then it'll crash. Um, so that's another cool place where you can uh, find things that are useful. So basically, to get that kernel going. Uh, if it crashes, you can go to kernel and restart, and then um, I will demo that now. So at the top, go to kernel and then just restart kernel, and then you'll just have to confirm. That clears everything. You just have to just run everything on your notebook again. Okay, so you can see it went from um, um, now it's at idle, so our kernel is ready to go. Um, is everyone ready to move forward? Yes, very good. Okay, so the title of this is using ISAT2 ATL1115, which is a data product of ISAT2. It's the gridded uh, Arctic and Antarctic land ice type product. Today, we're just going to look at Arctic because we're at fogs uh, to look at uh, ice surface height anomalies, but we'll also run through quite a few of other things. Um, I wrote this tutorial along with Tasha and then uh, Jessica Scheich, who's um, who's been chiming in remotely and Luis Lopez. Okay, so what we're gonna learn today is we're gonna learn how to gather data from different sources, both uh, cloud hosted and non-cloud hosted, um, cloud optimized and non-cloud optimized. We're gonna learn about coordinate reference systems and why they matter, uh, how to use geometries such as points and polygons to define an area of interest and how we can subset the data, and then basics of how the IcePix library simplifies obtaining and interacting with ISAT2 data and how we can use X-Ray to simplify the import of multi-dimensional uh, data. And then we'll open plot and explore um, the gridded data that's in ATL15. So we first have to set up our computing environment. Um, so you can see here, uh, we've got this tip up here that just tells you about the pip install. So there are many libraries that are already on CryoCloud, but for whatever reason, if you're interacting with a library that's not, you would just do pip install and then the library name, and you do it in its own cell and let that happen. Um, it does happen a lot faster than locally in my experience, but all the libraries that we're using today don't require that. So we'll just hit this first cell and run that. Um, what you can see is we're importing libraries, and then we're just defining a utility function that will convert long lat coordinates to uh, a um, XY coordinate system. 
Okay, great. So just a quick little crash course on subglacial lakes. There are two broad classes. There are stable volume lakes that have had a stable volume over the observational record, and then active lakes that episodically drain and fill when we've observed them. And we can observe those active fill drain lakes because they deform the ice surface above them as the water fills and drains in them. So because we're looking at an ice elevation product, uh, we can investigate those active lakes. So we'll look at those and we'll focus on ones that have been found in Greenland. So this is a, a recent uh, review paper that uh, collated an inventory of lakes across the world. And then they've got the two types in these uh, two different symbol types. So the active ones are in the blue triangles and then the stable ones are in the red circles. So you can see we've got a few in uh, Southwest Greenland and then one up here on this ice cap. Okay, great. So from there, what we can do is we can go to this paper and they actually have put a data set up here in the supplementary information. So we're going to grab information from that. Um, I've already done that for you, so you don't need to do it yourself. It's this other file that's in the folder. So it's already living there. So what we did for that was we just went to the paper. We downloaded that data file, this supplementary data. It was downloaded locally to our computer. And then from there, it's very easy to upload. You can either be in your file file explorer, uh, let's see, so like um, here, and then you just find the file manually. And then from there, one moment. Um, how do you switch between screens? Because the command that I use on my computer is not doing that. Um. Oh, maybe it's like the th three. Yeah. Oh, go from there. This. Ah, my apologies. Should have navigated away. Okay. Yes. Um. So we can just drag and drop to where we want it to live, um. Or we can use this little icon here, which is the upload button. So that's one way to get data into CrowdCloud if it's not cloud hosted. Something like a um ancillary data on a a paper. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll read this data into a GeoPandas geodata frame to look at these lakes a little bit more. So from there, um, I just kind of walked you through how you would upload data. So this tells you how to do that. And then what we'll do is we'll use that uploaded um, CS, uh, Excel file, and then we'll just read it in. Um, so you can see here, we've read it into a Pandas data frame, easy peasy. And we're looking at the, the top of it. Uh, but because this was downloadable via a URL, one thing that we can do is we can use this, um, this pandas read Excel method just on the URL itself. So if we know what the data set looks like, we can just download directly via a URL. So let's try that. And you can see we get the same result. Um, we do have to know a little bit about the file structure of that data first. Um, as you can see, I needed to know that I need to go to the sheet name Greenland. So in some cases, you will have to download this data just to familiarize yourself with its structure so that you know how to read it. But once you do that, um, it's very easy to import it just via a URL. Okay, so um, from here, we can increase the functionality of this pandas data frame. Instead, use a geo pandas data frame. So the advantage of a geo pandas geo data frame is it has this additional geometry column. And what that allows us to do is create shapely objects like points and polygons and lines and other things that can help us interact with this data uh, and have a bit more functionality. So what I'm doing is I'm just creating a geo pandas geo data frame from that that pandas data frame, and I'm creating the geometry from the long and lat coordinates that were in that data set initially. And so you can see um, we've got that same data frame. It still has the long and lat columns, but we've now created this new column that has a point geometry, which um, I believe, if I remember from the paper correctly, this is just the centroid of the lake. Okay, um, at this point, are there any questions? We've already um, interacted data two ways. It's, uh, any any questions? If not, I will continue. Okay. Uh, please interrupt. Just raise your hand. Um, same with online. Tasha is checking out the chat online, and so is Jessica. Okay, great. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just filter on lake types since we're interested in those active subglacial lakes that we can look at with surface height anomalies. So we'll just go into that uh, GeoPandas Geo data frame and filter on the lake type, and you can see it looks like we have six lakes um, across Greenland. Uh, 
And remember, we've subset to Greenland already because we were just reading that Greenland sheet on that bigger inventory. Okay, great. So next we're going to go into what is a coordinate reference system, or sometimes you will see EPSG. So this tells you how the Earth's 3D surface is projected onto a 2D plane map. Um, and you can see here's a few different examples from uh, data carpentry tutorial. These are really great tutorials just to kind of get some basic skills. I recommend checking out those if you have time. And this shows you how we can project the contiguous United States in different projections. And you can see they look quite different. Um, so it, it, it is important to pick uh, the one that's one going to make um, your, your data look the best as far as um, just interpretability of your map, but also um, another big issue with coordinate reference systems is they distort the land area because we're going from a 3D surface to a 2D surface. So I found this graphic from Earth Lab, which is another great set of tutorials that are focused on um, geospatial type stuff. Um, and you can see very intuitively on a human head what different projections do as far as distorting the different areas of a human head. Um, and that's the same thing happens with the continental land masses. Um, and then what is it EPSG? So this is just um, uh, what was a group that made these codes. It was the European Petroleum Survey Group. So that's why you'll see that a lot of times in code. Um, so yes, um, we want to minimize these distortions. So we usually select a projection that is localized to the area that we're looking at. So at Greenland, um, I think Joe yesterday mentioned you always want to use 3413. Uh, because it's the best projection for Greenland. It minimizes those distortions. Um, and so here's um, an example of that. If we were trying to uh, do a projection of the whole globe, um, we, we would be looking at something like the geoid, and then um, we do a global datum like the WGS84. This is the one that we're very used to, the long lat coordinates. But if we do something a little bit more localized, like looking at Greenland, we'd want to do a local datum. So that's what the 3413 uh, is doing. It's, it's um, maximizing the fit, minimizing the distortion uh, for that local region. Okay, um, and then, uh, yes. And then um, this kind of tells you about what, what a datum is. It's sort of your relative reference point. And I mentioned that just because ATL 15 does use a datum. Um, so thinking about what your datum is, is important for interacting with the data later. Um, and then there's just a couple other websites where you can look up CRS codes to find the most appropriate one for where, where you're studying. Okay, from there, what we'll do is we'll plot up this data just to see where the active subglacial lakes are, uh, just as a demonstration that we've imported all this data correctly. And I've got two separate plots. One is using that WGS84, uh, the long lat for global projection, and then one that's um, specific for Greenland, the 3413. Um, you can see for the long lat, uh, the, the top of Greenland, the more northern latitudes get really distorted. They get way thicker and bigger um, in that projection. Whereas if we use something localized, you can see it looks a little bit more realistic, less, less distorted. Okay, from here, uh, we will go ahead and use those shapely points that we made in the GeoPandas GeoData frame. And then what we'll do is we'll expand from that point to create a search radius uh, and make a polygon around that point so that we can, one, search for data and then subset data. And that becomes really important, especially for low-level data products um, like the lower ATL numbers on ISAT. And we'll talk about what ISAT2 is in the data products in a second, but some of the data sets are quite large. So you don't want to download the whole thing. You want to subset as early as possible. Yes. So. Um, what we're doing here is we're just going to go ahead and create a geo series. A geo series is kind of like a GeoPandas geo data frame, but it's just more, it's, it's a little simpler. So we're just creating a new column essentially that takes our GeoPandas geo data frame and then converts it to the, um, we're, we're changing the CRS to be the Greenland CRS. So instead of being in long lat coordinates, we're now in XY coordinates. And then what we can do is this cool little method, method called a buffer. And so what this does is it just goes beyond that point um, and creates a shape around that point. So it'll create a polygon circle around that point. And I've just set it to be, since we're in XY coordinates that are in meters, I've just set this to be 10,000 meters, so 10 kilometers. And then I'm just making a copy of, of this GeoPandas GeoData frame. 
and adding that new geometry as the column. So instead of the point, it'll now be the polygon. So I'll just run that. And you can see it's the same thing, but in, now instead of having points for our geometry, it's now a polygon. So it's a circle around that original point that is has a 10 kilometer radius. So that's our search radius around the active subglacial lakes that we are looking at. <laughs> yes, okay, so what is ISAT2? I've been talking about a lot. Uh, this is NASA's Ice Cloud and Land Ele Elevation Satellite 2. Uh, we got a little bit of intro from about that from Dennis yesterday, so I think you're somewhat familiar with it. But just to refresh your memory, it is a laser altimeter. So it uh, beams out laser pulses, and then it looks at it gets the range once it reflects and comes back to the detector. And then from there, we can get elevation, um, ele the elevation below the satellite because the satellite knows where it is um, using various methods like looking at the stars above it uh, um, and uh, GPS. Okay, so it's got uh, three pairs of, of, of beams, so six six lasers total. And so we get a lot of a lot of great information from the satellite. Um, the, the coverage of the data is so dense that what they can do is take these point measurements and rasterize them into a grid. And so that's the data product that we're going to be looking at. So there are two coupled data products that go together. There's ATL14, which is this really high resolution, it's 100 meter resolution digital elevation model that um, is um, is of the ice sheet surface. And so this can be used for like ice sheet modeling and other things like that. And then ATL15 is the accompanying height changes that are differenced from that reference DEM. So we're just going to look at ATL15 today because we're interested in those height changes versus the that digital elevation model surface. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll stream this data set from the uh, NASA Earth Data Cloud. And I've got a couple links in here that will walk you through um, how to find and access cloud-hosted data. So this is a little how-to guide from NASA Earth Data. Um, so this is great to, to check out when you've got some, some free time. And then this second one is this complete list of cloud-hosted data sets that are available from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, so these are both great to check out. Okay. So what, what we'll do is we'll use a library called IcePix, and Jessica uh, online is our resident expert in IcePix. Uh, she uh, developed this portion of the tutorial, so I hope I do it justice. Um, so it's a it's a it's a, a package just like any other one that you would import into a library. But what it does, uh, one of the things, one of the many things it does is it simplifies is the, it simplifies the um, the authentication with the Amazon Web Services S3 buckets. So. What we'll do first is it takes either like a shape file or a KML or a geo package as a search radius when you're trying to search and subset data. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that GeoPandas geodata frame that's got the polygons for a search radius. And then I'm just gonna take one. I'm gonna look at the one active subglacial lake that was up in Northeast Greenland on the ice cap. And I'm gonna spit this out into a file, into a geo package. And that's what I'll use to search with ice picks. So that's what that cell is doing. You can see in my file directory, I created that new file. And then from there, I'm gonna start with these different um, arguments that are that go into the ice picks query object. So we've got a short name, which tells us which data set we wanna look at, ATL 15. And then we're looking at the spatial extent, which is uh, that um, geo package that we just made, which is that polygon that we made earlier. And then we're just gonna feed it a date range. So we'll do that and then we'll query for that object. And so it's set it up in this uh, region, um, object. And then from there, we can do different methods on that to um, just confirm that um, everything that we thought we did, we did. So one thing we can do is we can visualize the spatial extent, and it will create um, an interactive view of where that is. Well, this is loading. Are there any questions? This is usually faster. I feel like it's because we're all on here, maybe perhaps. Stopping. Uh, like to interrupt. Let's press the stop button. 
Ah, yes. Oh, and it worked. Okay, great. So you can see we've got this interactive visual. Um, it uses Bokeh, which is a, a, a and GeoViews, which are two libraries to visualize data interactively. So we can see here we've got some tools on the right. So we can click on some of those and we can actually uh, zoom uh, and pan. Let's see. Yeah, so we can zoom out here uh, and just confirm that, yes, we are looking at that ice cap. Yep, that's right. And again, we're looking at that polygon circle that we've made around the point at that active subglacial lake. Cool, so that's looking good. And then from there, we can do this other method to look at the available data granules. Okay, so it looks like there are four, tells us the, the total size of all of them and then what the average size is. And then from there, we can get the granule IDs. And then we're gonna feed it in these arguments telling us, uh, letting us know what the IDs are and then um, that if they are cloud hosted, cloud equals true. So uh, Jessica, Jessica did a lot of work uh, this past week to make this, this work um, since a lot of this data is recently cloud hosted. And so we actually get the S3 URLs for this data product. And you can see there are four because for ATL 15, there are four different resolutions available. So we can see that in the file name. It's the ATL 15. Um, we're looking specifically at Greenland. That's the GL. And then it's got the various uh, resolutions. So we'll just go ahead and look at the finest resolution because why not? And that's what this cell does is it's just um, indexing to grab that last one, the finest resolution one. And let's see. Ah, yes. Um, so, so if for whatever reason you are using a data set that is doesn't have something like ice picks to easily access the data, um, you can go to Earth Data and search for the data set itself. So I've got a link in there that brings you how to do that. So this is just a how-to guide from NSIDC. But if you go to um, NASA's Earth Data Search, it's relatively simple. It's just a matter of clicking a box that says that it's a cloud-hosted data set. So here, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, is kind of um, a GUI interface to search for these data sets. But um, yes, so we can do that same thing rather than interacting with a library, for instance, for something that um, was not ISAT2 related. So we just search the, the for the name or some keyword, and then we just want to click available in Earth Data Cloud, and that'll pull up the cloud hosted data sets um, for faster streaming and whatnot. And then we'll go up here and just search that keyword. And you can see we get the same thing. We get um, there's ATL 14 and 15, and there's a lot more granules here because it's for the different regions. And we just queried for Greenland and then the various uh, resolutions. So that's how you search for it. Okay, uh, but thankfully we have IceFix to simplify all that for at least for ISAT2 data. And then from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna authenticate through Earth Data. This allows us to use those S3 URLs. Okay, so it's telling me I, I've authenticated, I think because I've recently done this and uh, used a token versus my password. Um, so I'll give you all a second to authenticate with Earth Data, and please raise your hand if you're running into any snags. You should have a box that opens that asks for your user ID, and then you type in your user ID, and then it asks for your Earth Data login password. Uh, you have to have an Earth Data uh, user ID and password to be able to do that, which was in the email that I sent to you. If you haven't been able to do it yet, you can do it after this. How's everyone doing? Anyone still working on it that needs help or time? Oh, so um, you're now authenticated. There's an error going on right now in the system. So this 
This part right here is not normal. They're doing some sort of maintenance with NSIDC and dealing with these um, end user. They're they're playing with the end user um, end user license agreements. These are things we'll show you in just a minute. They're really uh, they're one of the few places that haven't been streamlined with um, Earth Earth Access. But basically, you have to provide. Uh, an end user license agreement, you have to click that you accept it in Earth Data, depending on the product or the DAC that you're using. And right now they're playing with the EULAs at NSIDC. So this doesn't work the way that it's supposed to. This runs. This next one is normally how you would finish authentication. That doesn't work right now because they're playing with that. Um, so that information is there for you. But uh, we have a workaround that's right below that. So you'll see you get this error for this next line, then we manually add the credentials here for the S3 file system and you're authenticated. That you that last line you shouldn't need um, once NSIEC finishes this maintenance. Yeah, so we've got a workaround right now that we just went through. Um, so the last cell executed properly, so we should be able to open up this data set. Um, so you can see we're just using that S3 URL and we're opening it with this S3 library and we're opening it with a uh, X-ray data data set. So that's loading now. And then once that gets loaded, uh, one uh, there's multiple ways that we can acquaint ourselves with this data product. So there's the overview page, which kind of gives you very basic information. And it also has all the links to download this data set from the NSIDC. Um, so yeah, some really basic information, the CRS, uh, the resolution, things like that, uh, where it is spatially and whatnot, and then all the different download mechanisms. Um, but we are streaming, so we don't need to download. Um, that is one way, but it is very overview information. So another way that we can do this um, is we can look at the data products data dictionary. So this gives every field that's in the data and a description of what it is. So if you see a weird keyword and you're not sure what it is, this is the plated place to go to figure out what it means. Uh, but luckily, we're doing some. We're doing something very simple. We're using geographic coordinates and delta H, um, which we can find in here. But I think you all can kind of guess what that is. Uh, so yeah, um, these are so long that a, a keyword search is very helpful. So you can see there's a whole group for delta H, and then there is a variable delta H. So it's a float, um, and it is our quarterly height change at at um, this resolution. Um, so this resolution is that coarsest resolution, but we actually downloaded the finest resolution one. So this is actually um, at a finer resolution. And then another way that we can do this, another fantastic benefit of X-Ray is a lot of this information is in the X-Ray data set. So you can see um, if you're interested in Delta H, um, there's this little note icon that you click and it will tell you that same information, um, height change relative to the datum surface. Um, but it is nice to be able to look at the data dictionary and um, other things, because sometimes the descriptions are a little bit different in each place, so it can be helpful to look in multiple places as you're familiarizing yourself. Okay, and then there's a third document that um, I don't consult frequently, but it is there if you need it. It's the algorithm theoretical basis document, so it's kind of the nitty gritty of how all of this stuff is uh, calculated. And for a gridded product, that is kind of interesting, but definitely sort of in the weeds. Okay, and then. Um, from there, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at height change per quarter. So uh, all of this stuff is relative to that datum, the ATL 14 product, that DEM. So there's two ways that we can deal with that. We can either subtract the datum directly, or we can do is we can just difference two different time slices. So one quarter to the next, because it has um, an orbital repeat of about 90 days, so about a quarter of a year. So we'll do that method. Um, we just subtract one time slice from another. And you can see because the datum is embedded in there, because it's the difference from, um, if we do the math out, the datum disappears. And we just get the difference from one time to the next. So that's what we'll be doing. So this is just a plotting function that uses that delta H data variable. And um, yes, you can see here we've got height change and then it's a divergent color bar indicating um, you know, if it increases or uh, if it decreases um, from the previous quarter. So you can see a lot of it's near zero, uh, but you can see we don't see a whole lot of change, but that's because of the color bar that it's automatically done. But we can see some stuff along the margin, but we can, um, 
to, um, we can change the color of our bounds a little bit so we can see a little bit more of the data structure and we can just explore um, that height variable. So the DHDT, that was just a subtraction of one time slice to the other DHs. And then we can find out what the min and max is. So we can just manually set it to that min and max so that we can um, see what that looks like. Okay, so we see a little bit more uh, and still along the margin, um, but then from there, we can zoom in even a little bit more and we can do um, an X-ray method. It's this quantile method. So we're just gonna look at 98% of the data. So we're gonna pull out those outliers so that we can uh, saturate the color bar and look at things a little bit more in depth. And so you can see it's um, interacting with the X-ray data set and it's making this new data array that tells us those quantiles that we put in. Um, so there's lots of methods like that that are off of X-ray data sets that are very handy. Okay, so we'll we'll use those uh, quantiles and um, we'll change the color bar a little bit so that the they extend to indicate um, that there are some outliers that we're not quite plotting with the range that we've got there. And so now we can see a lot more of the data structure um, for the change from the first time slice to the second time slice. Okay, and then from there, um, what I'm doing here is just creating a function to plot this stuff so that what you could do is you could just put in the next lake, or you could make a for loop and loop through all six of those active subglacial lakes, or perhaps you're studying something else like, um, like, um, an outward glacier and you want to see how it's, how it's thinning through time or thickening, um, so that you can do this, um, more efficiently and, um, do, do, do a function so that you can, um, automate this in some way. Okay. Um, so I've made the function, and so just um, very quickly, what it does is it just uh, subsets our data set using the, the min and max x, y coordinates that we uh, developed, that we will develop later. And then what it does is it goes through and does that quantile method to um, take out those outliers so that they're just sort of at the, at the, bound, the boundaries of the color bar so that we can see more of that data structure in the continental interior since we're doing a, a, a bigger view. And then, um, and then it plots it up. And then I've got, um, you can kind of look through this code to maybe get ideas for, for your plots, but some of it is just to kind of make, clean up the axes, make them in kilometers versus meters, things like that. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves we've got six, six active subglacial lakes across the continent, and we'll just zoom into one. Um, um, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, maybe someone here does, but we'll, we'll look at that one. And we can actually do this method off of it to look at the geometry bounds. And so it'll give us the, the um, Oh, yes, sorry. Um, there was uh, some editing last night that didn't quite make it in the last push. So um, as you're running through this, if you're doing it interactively, please delete what I just deleted, the geometry.bounds. Um, I was just doing some playing around that didn't quite make it. I apologize for that. So just delete that. Okay, so we've got that stored. And that just has the min and max, x and y. And what we'll do is we'll feed that in here. So remember, we're still in long lat in this GeoPandas GeoData frame. So we're just assigning that uh, min and max, x and y, um, which are long lat in the projection that we're in, to long and lat min and max for this particular lake. And then what we'll do is that we'll use that utility function that we had at the very beginning when we were setting up our computing environment, and we'll just convert this to instead be um, uh, X and Y coordinate that are in the Greenland projection, the 3413. And then we'll use that function that we just created. And then what that'll do is create a trellis plot that has the time series of all the time slices that are available in ISAT2 data. Um, so we can see here, um, Maybe should have put some some lab some labels indicating what the time is, but these are quarterly steps of ISAT two data. Uh, doesn't look like there's too much going on. That might look like an active lake draining and filling, but this lake was discovered pre ISAT two, so it could be that it just doesn't have any activity. Uh, but you know, perhaps this one is is some something going on at the lake. A uh, little little hard to tell with this one, but you can play around with this um, if you if you go into um, these cells, you can always change the name, look at any of the other six lakes, or um, look at the lakes that are in Iceland or um, Europe and whatnot and, and explore a little bit more. Okay, so from there, um, another way that we can plot this is using hollow views. 
so this is uh, kind of like an alternative to matplotlib, but you can see it uses some backend matplotlib components. And this plots a, a very interactive version of the plots that we just made, kind of like um, IcePix did using hollow views and Bokeh to zoom in and out and pan um, and make some mild adjustments. And because this is a time series, it actually will put up a uh, like a play pause button. So you can start playing through those time slices and view it as you would view like a video or a GIF. So it's taking a second to load. Are there questions either online or in person? Okay, so it loaded. Um, you can see it, it um, has the look and feel of Matplotlib, but we've got some additional functionality. Like I said, we've got that play pause button so we can start um, going through the time slices. Oh, I, I pressed pause apparently. Oh, got it. Okay, it's not one button, my bad. Okay, so you can see we're kind of strolling through the time slices. So yeah, that's a, a, a cool library to, to explore data in that way. Um, it's an alternative to making a your own function. Okay, so from here, we'll just kind of clean up our environment. Um, we were using this intermediary geo package file to search on this one lake that was on the ice cap. So we'll just use the OS library to remove that. So that disappears. Uh, next up is sort of a, a new part of this. this. This part was written by Luis Lopez. So we're going to stream cloud-hosted data using this a new library called Earth Access. So this, uh, like IcePix, uh, simpl simplifies the authentication through NASA Earth data so that we can search and stream all the data sets that are available on NASA Earth data, not just ISAT2. This is a, a follow-on to Earth data. If, all of you, if anyone has used the Earth data library, this is basically the same thing, but it's the v7 version cool yeah so we'll import that um, we'll just look at the version number since it's new um, it's kind of nice to know where we are okay great and then there are uh, three different ways that we can authenticate we can set up as environment variables where we just do earth data username and then put our username same with the password uh, we could also store our credentials in a net, uh, .net RC file. Both of these are kind of suboptimal because it kind of leaves your password where someone else might see it. So we would not recommend that. Um, instead, we recommend using this interactive in notebook login, kind of like we did earlier with uh, the NASA Earth data through IcePix. Um, so because I authenticated earlier, um, it's saying that we're authenticated. I think if you run through that cell, it'll be the same for you. Okay, then from there, um, we can search um, using Earth Access. So you can see here, we're gonna use this search method off of it and we'll just use a keyword search. So we'll search for anything that's got the keyword Sentinel in it and looking for cloud hosted data. And then we'll use this uh, library pretty print to just make the printout a little bit more uh, readable. Um, so you can see it finds 129 data sets and then it gives us this summary uh, by printing that. And so we get a little bit of metadata about the 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 oh did you have something? Oh mm. it's just showing two outputs. Oh right, yes. Um yeah, we're just seeing two um interesting. Okay, yeah, we're just looking at two of these. Um another way that we can search is instead of a keyword search, um, we can search for the data sets short name. So um every data set has its own short name. So this is the, you can see we're gonna uh, get a little bit more information, not just the summary, but also the abstract. So we can see this HLS uh, S30, it's the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2. And um, yeah, a, a separate data set, a separate way to search for it. Now that we've searched for it, we found something that we're interested in. Now we can start searching for the individual granules from that data set. So there's two different ways that we can do this. We can either, either use a application programming in, interface, if you've heard of API, or we can build a query object. So in this tutorial, we'll do the query object, kind of like what we did with IcePix, where we made that query object, just because it has a lot more flexibility and customizability uh, and different uh, methods off of it that we can um, do things with. Uh, so first, what we'll do is we'll use this cool tool, bboxfinder.com. And so what this lets us do is it, um, let's us zoom into a region that we might be interested in, um, say it's Greenland or Iceland or Svalbard, um, we can zoom into the particular region, and then it automatically provides us a bounding box of the map view, um, but we can also create a uh, 
polygon, um, rectangle around a region that we might be interested in, and we can get the bounding box uh, coordinates from, from that polygon. So either the map view or the polygon, and then you just click this copy button to copy those coordinates, which uh, we've done in this notebook already for Iceland. So if you don't want to change anything, you don't have to, but if you want to look at a different region, you definitely can. Uh, so that's what we put in here. These are the bounding box coordinates in this particular order of long, lat, long lat, um, min max. And we're also searching for a temporal time range. And then we're using this concept ID, which is a ID that is specific to a data set and a particular version of that data set. So it's uh, highly specific. So we run through that. Um, it just um, gives us our query parameters that we already put in. Uh, if we do that method, the params method, and then we can look at the number of hits that are on that query object. Okay, it took a, a second. There's a lot of them. There's almost 5,000 hits. Okay, and there's a lot of other ways to search. So there's this link here that kind of walks through all the different methods. So, so a, a lot of ways to look at, at look for data. Okay, and then from there, what we can do is we can go to that granule list that we that we developed, um, and we'll just uh, we'll, we'll index and pull that first one off just to examine it. And then from there, what we can do is we can look at the data links of that granule. So you can see there is a ton, and that's because this particular data product has a bunch of bands. So each band of the data set has its own link. And you can see there in the TIFF format, earlier in the metadata, um, you may have noticed there in the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, uh, COG, you may have seen. Um, and then this is kind of talking about what Tasha mentioned earlier. Sometimes you may get an error, error, error as you're trying to download these that you haven't accepted a ULNA, this end user license agreement. And usually when the error comes up, it'll have a URL that you go to, and it's just part of the NASA Earth data where you log in and you essentially have to agree to the terms of use of that particular data set. Okay, so um, we can stream data with Earth Access. And if we've got enough memory that we're working with and, um, you know, as Tasha said, when we start on that login screen, we want to start small because usually we only need small. But if we need to bump up and use a little bit more memory, that's something that we can do at the login screen and stop our server and log back in with a, a, a great a larger, larger RAM if you need to do that. That's if you're reading in granules from an S3 bucket into your memory that's here on CryoCloud. And so um, Earth Access works the best with data sets that can be opened in X-Ray. So these are things like um, uh, H5, uh, HDF5, NetCDFs, um, and then anything cloud optimized like ZAR and whatnot, and the cloud optimized GeoTIFFs and whatnot. Um, uh, but um, if you've got older legacy data sets, um, something like HDF or um, whatnot, they can be a little challenging, but we do have an example of how to open those. But um, um, for now, Earth Access works the best with newer data sets. So we'll give you an example of that. So again, we're using our Iceland bounding box, and uh, we're looking for that harmonized Landsat Sentinel data. And we're going in a for loop through various years. And then what we'll do is we'll um, be, be searching per year, and then we'll be adding all the granules as we go through the year. So we can see um, we've got some granules in 2021 and 2022. And then from there, we'll do that same thing. We'll just look at the first granule to inspect it. We'll assign it a new um, variable scene. And you can see we've here we've got all the, the files, each for the different bands. And then um, we've got a little bit of metadata down here. OK, so there's kind of two ways we can get at these links. Um, there are the direct access links. So these are the ones that are from the S3 buckets. So these will let us stream. Uh, and then the other type of link are these external links, the ones that are available through the HTTPS. Um, these are not considered cloud hosted, even though they are on the internet. They're not um, the, the, the cloud uh, hosted data sets that we can stream easily. So what we want to do is preferably use those direct access links if it's got it. And you can see we pop those up. And yes, it is an S3 link. And yeah, Hila. Can you explain a little bit why the like HTTP? It's not considered cloud hosted. I mean, I guess I don't understand quite the. Sure. Yeah. So for folks online, the question was, why is that HTTPS 
link uh, not considered cloud hosted. And I'm going to let Tasha answer. It's just the S3. S3 is where the, it's the S3 bucket, and HTTPS okay. is like the URL that is on the prem for the system. Like if you are accessing data through the NSIDC website and it's you aren't accessing it's just a, it's a different location a different url for it so um before cloud hosted you were accessing https um links when you download data so if you take that https there that link there and you paste that into your browser or whatever you will get a download data like where do you want to save this mm -hmm. um so S3 allows you to stream it, and why that's really cool is, especially if it's cloud optimized, you can only you can you can grab just a portion of the data instead of all of it. Um, whereas with this, you have to grab the entire thing; like you can't just grab a chunk of it. So S3 actually, um, if it's cloud optimized data, allows you to um, to grab just a small subset of the data if you want to. Okay. Um, and we aren't showing that here. You can you can open either one of them completely into memory without downloading it from HTTPS or S3 if they're in the right formats. But um, yeah, into memory on Cloud Cloud. Yeah. Thanks, Tasha. And for cloud newbies, uh, on-prem is short for um, on-premises. So this would be a data file that is uh, housed at like a computer that's like at an SIDC. Okay, great. Um, so from there, we can go ahead and plot this up. And again, um, we are using the um, S3 link to open this, and we're using Earth Access to open the file. So not only did we search for it, authenticate with it, but we're also using this library to open the file files, um, which I guess is using, well, um, we're using Raster.io to open, but then we're relying on Earth Access to open the granule. So I guess we're using kind of two libraries to open it. And so you can see um, it opens it here um, with uh, Earth Access, and then Raster.io uh, um, will open it so that we can plot it here. Um, so you can see here. And then um, because I had a, a magic function earlier in the notebook, um, the matplotlib widget, um, we've got this functionality on the side where we can interact with this uh, a bit and zoom around um, if we are patient enough. It is a large file, so we might not be patient enough, but it does. Oh, there you go. It lets it kind of move around. And then as you hover your cursor, it's got information about the coordinates. So that is handy. OK, so from from here, what we'll do is we'll um, open this up into X-ray so that we can view the data, um, not just a visual of, of, of it, but actually uh, look at the raw values. So we've got the band data and then the coordinates. And you can see um, looking at the notes, uh, we can also look at those, what, how many values there are, that sort of thing. Okay, so next up is sort of um, the non-ideal working with legacy data formats, which we will have to do because there's data that we want to go back and look at, especially if we're doing time series or whatnot. Um, and until things are hosted in cloud-optimized formats, which I'm sure won't be the fastest process, we'll have to kind of work around. So this is a way to work around. We're going to look at this data set. It's uh, Mod 07 which is uh, atmospheric profiles um, from the moderate resolution imaging radio rate, uh, spectro radiometer on the Terra satellite. So this can be used to do atmospheric corrections on visual imagery so that we can get a surface reflectance measurement. That would be a, a use case for this. So it uses a HDF5 file, or excuse me, not five, it's older than that, HDF file, HDF EOS file. So much older. And um, while we could technically stream it, um, the only libraries that are able to open that type of file are not used to that kind of input of a, a URL versus a, a file location of where the data would be located on your local machine. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to download it to CryoCloud and then pull the data from a folder that we have on CryoCloud. So we'll search for it using the Earth Access again. So we've just changed our parameters. We're still looking at Iceland, but now we're looking at the short name for that for that um, modus or yeah for the modus data for the atmospheric profiles. And we've got nine granules that we can look at. And again, we can look at the uh, access links. So you can see there's a 
direct access and then an external link. So it is cloud hosted, but because it is that older data, data set, we have to do this workaround where we can use a library that could actually open it and is used to opening um, from like a file location versus a URL. Okay, so we'll demonstrate that trying to, trying to open something in X-Array, which would be the ideal. Uh, so we'll do this open multiple um, data sets here because uh, we've got a few granules. So it is trying, it's opening with earth access and it does that part properly. But then we get this error when we try to open an X-Ray. Uh, it just doesn't have the right compatibility. So womp womp. Um, so what we would do is we would use, uh, let's see. So um, what we need to do is download this to CryoCloud and then interact with it with an older data set that is used to a file file path versus a URL. So that's some code to do that. We'll pull in this PyHDF um, library and just a couple of functions from that. And that's how we would read this. So here's an example of that. So we've got our granules list. Do, do you wanna add something, Kasha? Oh, yeah. the, the code in red there is if you wanna open an HDF4 file, which is this format, then you can use that code to read it in. We're going to show you how you don't need to use that, how you can convert it so that um, you have a net NC4 file that you've converted to, and, and then you can uh, open it in X array, which wouldn't be possible without that conversion. Thank you, Tasha. I said that completely wrong. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we are going to pull off um, this HTML link here. And then from there, what we can do is you can replace the HTML endpoint of this URL instead with net uh, NC4. So we're gonna do that for all of the granules that we're looking at. Uh, so we'll do that. And you can see it's done that perfectly. The URL is the same, but instead of HTML, we've got NC4. Okay, and then from there, what we can do is we can go ahead and download that in that new format. So that worked. And then you can see here, it created a folder as we told it to, and it should have the data in there, and it does. Okay, from there, what we can do is we can, um, and we can also explore all of this in a notebook cell um, to see where these are. So we're just looking in that folder and then pulling out all the file names that are in there just to confirm that it's there. And then from there, um, we will navigate to that folder directory so that we can access those files. And you can see now we're in that folder um, here in the notebook. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll open the first file within there in X-Ray, which is of course optimal. And hey, it worked. Um, so that's a way that you can kind of get around these older file formats by converting them to a different file format and then downloading them to CryoCloud and then opening them in X-Ray. So as you get this rich data that's available when you open something in X-Ray like this, you've got all the data variables, you've got the coordinates, um, you can see 29 data variables, um, and then you've got all the attributes. So all the information you need is right there with just a few lines of code. If you tried to do this the, the old fashioned way with this older library that um, we had up here, um, you would really you would spend so much time putting in code to pull in every aspect of the data set. This is just a way to get all the all the data that you might need and look at it in all in one place. Okay, so um, uh, if we want to clean up our data set a little, if we no longer need those, uh, files, what we can do is we can interact with the file browser over here. Uh, we might want to just, hey, I want to delete this folder, but it, it won't let us because it has contents. So if you want to delete something here in the file browser, you actually have to go through and delete all the contents. Um, you, can, you can delete programmatically um, the whole file folder, but if you want to do it from here, you have to go into the folder. Yeah, so programmatically would be kind of like some of the earlier examples where we use the OS library to remove things. Um, so just showing you a different method to, to get at that if you prefer um, using GUI every once in a while. Uh, and it looks like there might be something still in there, some like hidden file. So this would be a case where we would need to do it programmatically. Okay, great. Um, so from there, uh, we have reached the end. Congratulations, you've completed this tutorial. This is just kind of a summary of some of the skills that uh, we went through and um, some references if you were interested in any of those data sets 
for any of the figures that got plotted in this in this paper. And then um, I know we kind of rushed through this and some of the cells are perhaps convoluted and there's a lot, a lot going on. So if you wanted to reach out to me, my website's on there and all my contact information. I'm happy to chat about this particular notebook or about anything Crowd Cloud. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Jessica? Uh, I was just going to build on what you were saying before uh, with the EULAs, the end user license agreements. Um, if you're trying to access NSIDC data in particular, you should not have to sign any of those. Um, and if you do, please let myself and or Luis know. Um, NSIDC is currently in the process of switching the type of authentication mechanism that they use. And so um, actually, some of the errors that you saw come up during the tutorial didn't come up last week, and then they decided to test the system, and so they came up this week, and so we were able to get the fixes in there. Um, but if you have any of those types of issues, particularly in the next couple of weeks, please do let us know um, so that we can try and stay on top of uh, on top of keeping keeping those fixed in the software. Um, that would be super helpful. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, so that just kind of tells you so this some of this authentication that we've just done it's very streamlined in Earth Access and some of the work that's in Ice Picks is literally come out last week. So um so these are brand new tools. Everything's super cool. You're just getting being able to access some of this stuff literally in the last few weeks. Um so yeah, if there's bugs, let us know, let um let Jessica know and um we'll help you figure it out. All right, we'll see you back here actually at uh, 11, uh, 28.